church. I echo what has already been said on this Mother's Day as we gather to worship. Thank you, Lord, for our mothers. And for many of us in the room, our own mothers are now in heaven. And so we thank God for them and for uh, many of you, the, the mother of your children. Um, it's a special time, though, to be able to gather. And even, even for those, we have several church members who um, have adopted children, uh, children that are in their families that they love on and spoil absolutely rotten and then turn them over to their parents and say, you figure it out now. And um, we even thank God for, for all, all of us. As Caleb mentioned uh, in the pew racks in front of you, there's a next step card. I would encourage you if you want to find out more about what's going on here, whether you're watching online or watching in the room. I know if you're watching online, you don't have one of these in the pew rack in front of you, but you can go to HuffmanBaptist.org and there's a connect button on the homepage and you can fill that out. And um, hopefully God will say something to you today and, and just kind of bring you along. Last week, we started into a little short two-part series uh, kind of based on where Jesus had gathered uh, with or had met the woman at the well and and then his disciples came back and at the end of that whole conversation Jesus said to uh, his disciples he said look and he was pointing I believe past the fields that were around them and pointing to the road that was coming from town where the woman had gone back and told everybody in town about this Jesus and they were all coming to see who this was and so Jesus points to them and he says to the disciples look the, the fields are ready for the harvest the people are coming it's time. It's time for us to be about the mission of God in this place. It's time for us as a church. We know that the people are all around us and that God has placed us here for a reason. But this morning, I want us to kind of drill down on that concept of it's time that the fields are, right, are ready for the harvest. And I want us to really begin to think about our families. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find the nation of Israel poised to enter into the land of God's promise. They've made their way from Egypt through the wilderness to the plains of Moab. An entire generation had wandered in the wilderness because of their disobedience of going into the land when God told them to, but, but now they are at this point, they've defeated multiple enemies. They have had periods of disobedience, periods of obedience, but now it's time. They are ready to cross over into the land of God's promise. Now, Moses, we know, will not be making the journey into the land of God's promise. And so Moses is before the people and he gives them one last sermon, if you will. And we find that sermon in the book of Deuteronomy. So I'll give you a moment to find the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is going to be our text this morning. And specifically, we're going to look beginning in verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. As we get ready to read from God's Word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for the truth of your Word. And Lord, as we think about the command that Moses gave to your people before they crossed over into the land of promise, God, you have given us that same command. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to feel, and hands and feet to move for your glory. Lord, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. The word says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone and you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God. 
Now, this passage is not specifically about the family per se, but it does speak to the importance of the family as the basic foundational unit of society. The fear of the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The fear of the Lord is foundational for success in a family from generation to generation. We've already been singing about that this morning, that God is faithful, God keeps his covenant from generation to generation. And, and the way we make sure that happens is that we pass that on from generation to generation. Fear of the Lord leads to obedience, and obedience leads to blessing. God was about to bless Israel as they crossed over into the land of his promise. Last week, we established that it's time for us to cross over into our own land of God's promise as a church. The fields are indeed ready for the harvest. And what God has in store for us is full, and it is rich, and it is wonderful. And just like it was true for Israel, that they, as they prepared to cross over, it's true for us. As we, as we go into the fields that are ready for the harvest, as we are living our lives on mission, that, that there's this idea that, that we do so because God loves us and we love him and he has commanded us to do this. Amen. But listen, whether you are a mom or a dad, a grandmother, a grandfather, an aunt or an uncle, the church cannot take the place of the family. Amen. Parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, that's where we come in. We are to teach the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. And we are to teach obedience that leads to God's blessing. We are to teach our children, our grandchildren from generation to generation. And you say, okay, I, I get it. I, I'm on. I, we're, we're, it's our responsibility. What is it that we are supposed to be teaching? What is it that we are supposed to be passing on from generation to generation? I think it can be summarized in three two-word statements. We are to pass on from generation to generation that there is one Lord. Amen. Verse 4 begins with a call to the people. Listen, hear, O Israel. Just a couple of observations about these opening words. First, the, the verb hear or, or listen is given in the second person singular. Now he's talking to an entire nation. And you would think that in talking to an entire nation, if he's going to give them a command, which is a second person, you, that it would be done in the plural since there are many people. If I'm speaking to the church, I'm speaking to a room full of people. But it's in the singular. And what that teaches us is that even though we are individuals, we are part of a greater whole. We are part of something that is, that is significant in and of itself. It is a command that is directed toward the entire nation as a corporate body. Not to individuals, but to one people. Second, the verb doesn't just mean to hear something as in it enters into one ear and picks up speed in the middle and goes out the other side. To hear in the Hebrew language carried with it the idea of obedience. What you hear, you are supposed to do something with. Hear, O Israel, listen, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone, he is one. Yahweh is the covenant name of God. It, in Hebrew, it is four letters. Yod, He, Wa, He. Y H W H in English. And, and, and it is the covenant name of God. It is, it is the name that when, when Moses asked the Lord, Who is it that I'm to say that is sending me? And he said, I am. Is the covenant name of God. And it was, it was so special, it was so holy, so unique, that the Hebrews were afraid to even speak it out loud. And so whenever they would come across anything in reading, if it was Y-H-W-H, -H, they would look at that and they would just say, Lord. In fact, I'll promise you in your copy of God's Word this morning, you can look and that word is Lord and it is different than just 
capital L-O-R-D. It is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And anytime you see that, you know that in the Old Testament, that is the covenant name of God. It's important that we remember the holiness of God. God is approachable, and that is a wonderful thing for us, that, that he allows us to, to crawl up into his lap, if you will, and talk to our daddy. But he is also holy, and we don't ever need to lose sight of that reality. You see, the Hebrews had come out of a land that was inundated with multiple gods. The, 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 the Egyptians had multiple gods. Everybody that they encountered, if they were going into the land of God's promise, the Canaanite people who lived there, they had multiple gods. So why do they have so many gods? Well, because each god had a specialty. You know, it's kind of like some of us when we go to the doctor's office, right? We got a doctor for this, we got a doctor for that, we got a doctor for this other thing, and then we got another doctor that tells us what to do with all the other doctors. They had all of these gods because every god had its own specialty. But God says, it's not going to be that way with you. you. You don't need more than one god. For all of these other people, they had to have these other gods, but God says, I am it. There is one Lord, and he is complete in all of his attributes and in all of his powers Yahweh is not lacking in anything. And because of that reality, there is no need for other gods. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Amen. This verse is the very foundation of the Hebrew confession of faith even today. It's called the Shema. Hear. It is, it is foundational. It affirms that there is one God who is complete in power, complete in all of his attributes, and his name is is Yahweh. There is one Lord who demands one love. Because of who he is, because of who God is, we are commanded to love him with the totality of our being. Now, we use that word love all the time, right? I love pizza. I love donuts. I can't eat either one of those things, but I love them both. I love my wife, I love my daughter, I love my children, I love my grandchildren, I, I, I love you. That word love has different meanings in every one of those contexts. And for many of us, love is, is just a feeling. But in the context here, love is not a feeling. In fact, it actually has no connection to emotion whatsoever. It is an action of the will. And notice that God is the one who initiates this. He says, you are going to love me. I had a deacon in a church one time that first, one of the very first times I met him, he said, he said, pastor, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you and you're gonna love me back. And that's, that's what God says to us. He says, I love you and you are going to love me back. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That wasn't uncommon in the world in those days for a sovereign to demand the love of his subjects. In fact, kings in those days would demand that all of their subjects love them. Now, not in the way we think of love. It was more the idea of being totally committed, totally loyal to that sovereign. And that's what God says to us. When he says, I want you to love me with all of, your, all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, he's saying, I want you to be all in. I want you to be totally committed to me. I want you to be completely loyal to me because I am one and there is no other. Jesus summarized this in John chapter 14, verse 15. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's an understanding that to love God is to obey God with the totality of who we are. You say, well, why does he say with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength? Well, for the Hebrew, the heart was not the center of emotion, but it was the center of man's intellect. See, we, we think of that as the brain. You know, I guess if he had been writing this to our culture, he said, I want you to love me with all of your brain, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. So, so the, the heart was the center of man's intellect. The soul was the inner part of man. 
the center of his will. In other words, I don't want you just to be committed, but this needs to be something that you have taken your entire will and you have said, I want to be all in. It is a complete decision. And then the strength was the outer part of man. By the way, the Hebrews did not separate these things. They, they thought of man in terms of these. In other words, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. You don't have a heart, you are a heart. You don't have strength, you are strength. They thought of these three things as the complete totality of who we are as human beings. We're a collection of all three. The idea is that we are to love God in word, in thought, and in deed. Amen. One commentator said, Israel must love God with all of its essence and expression. There's one Lord who demands one love and commands obedience to one law. One Lord, one love, one law. So you have the uniqueness of God that's expressed back in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We don't have a bunch of gods, we have one God. The uniqueness of God expressed in verse 4 not only demands that we love him as expressed in verse 5, but also demands that his word have the full attention of his people. Amen. His word is the expression of his will. And his word is to be upon the hearts of his people such that they are always aware of what God has said. This is where family comes in. You see, the religious education of our children, the religious education of our grandchildren, the religious education of our nieces and our nephews, the religious education of our children is too important for us to hand that off to somebody else. My late brother spent years as a student minister and then he was a teacher. And, and it used to frustrate him to no end when he was a student minister and parents would bring their, their teenagers to him and they would say, fix him, fix her. And he was like, I can't fix what you've been messing up for the last 13 years. That's not my job. I, I get equally frustrated with people who, who, who decry the moral decay of our society by saying, we took God out of the public schools and now look what happened. First of all, you couldn't take God out of the schools if you wanted to. Amen. I, I've always said, as long as there are tests in school, there will be prayers in school. Now sometimes those prayers are Hail Marys. Lord, I ain't done nothing to prepare for this, but please help me to pass this test. All the teachers in the room said, yep. You couldn't take God out of the schools if you tried, but second, it is not the responsibility of a secular institution to teach the truth of God's Word. It is not the responsibility of a secular institution to do what God has clearly told us to do in our families. It's too important for us to pass on to someone else. Moses knew that this would be important for them as they prepared for the future. Our English translations miss, I think, the full impact of what Moses was saying. He says, and you shall you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. You shall teach them diligently to your children, some translations read. But the underlying meaning of it is this. You shall, and the word shall is an imperative. It is, there's no wiggle room when you see the word shall. That is a legal term that says this must happen. You shall impress them upon your children. You shall impress them upon your children. All right, I'm, I'm, some of you are going to get offended by what I'm about to say, but that's okay. How many of you have seen the Harry Potter movies or read Harry Potter books? All right, about half in the room. Okay, so half of you think that I'm a heretic, and the other half are like, yeah, those are great stories. So there, there's a scene in one of the movies, and I don't remember which, which, book it's, which book it is, but Harry Potter's in trouble. And, and he's, he's been called to the office of Dolores Umbridge. And if you've read the books or seen the movies, she's just a nasty woman. She's, just, she's, she's like my least favorite character in the whole series. 
and, and she's, she's telling Harry that he has to write on a piece of paper, I will not tell lies, I will not tell lies. And he says, how long do I have to do this? And she says, until it is impressed upon you. That's not exactly, but it's the idea. And so he starts writing, and as he writes, his hand starts to hurt. And the more he writes, the, the more vivid it becomes. I, he's writing it on paper, but across his hand it says, I will not tell lies. It is being impressed upon him. That's the idea here. Now, no, God's not telling us to literally go and carve into the hands of our children that they will not tell lies or, or that they are to love the Lord their God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. But, but you get the idea that when we are teaching them diligently, it means we are making an impression upon them that will never leave them. Amen. God's Word was to be such a part of family life that it filled the conversations when they sat around the house, when they walked to town, God's Word was to be so important that it should be a part of the conversation at the end of the evening and at the beginning of the next day. The Hebrews were successful in integrating their faith into their daily lives because religious education began in the home. And it was focused on life application rather than just a collection of information, which is knowledge. In fact, the Life Application Bible states, if you want your children to follow God, you must make God a part of your everyday experiences. You must teach your children diligently to see God in all aspects of life, not just those that are church-related. Verse 8 introduces a concept that is interesting. Now, in my understanding, Moses is using some figurative language here, just like he did back in verse 7 when he said to impress them upon your children. Verse 8, when he said to talk about them when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, and when you get up. But then he concludes this by saying you are to bind the words on your hand and your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your house and on the city gate. I think the emphasis here is how important it is for us to integrate God's Word into every aspect of our lives. Now the Hebrews came to take that quite literally and would write the words of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 and some others and place them inside little containers that were called phylacteries and they would, would have those bound on their arms and they would write them on their forehead and they would write them on the doorpost of their house. Now I'm not sure what good that does. It's kind of like if you take your Bible and you put it under your pillow at night and you lay your head down on your pillow and say, God, I want some of this to soak in. I, I don't think it's going to work that way. But then neither does leaving a Bible on a coffee table collecting dust. Oh, did I say that out loud? Just a reminder. All of this was important because the people were about to enter into a land that was filled with false gods. They were going into, it was the land of God's promise, but it was a completely pagan culture that they were going to be going into. In verse 10, tells us that the Lord your God will soon bring you into the land that he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. seems to be telling us that God's blessing is directly proportionate to the level of our faithfulness. If you love the Lord your God and pass it on to future generations, then you're going to enjoy cities that you did not build, the bounty of houses that you did not fill, cisterns that you did not dig, and a harvest that you did not plant. God's blessings are a direct result of our obedience. And families, Moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers. It's our job to pass that on. I want, I want to give you some very practical steps as we close out this morning. First, you must be convinced that God is who he says he is. 
You must be convinced that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You must be convinced that the God who has revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ is in fact the one and the only God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father apart from me. If you don't have a real relationship with Jesus, there's no way you should expect your children to ever get it. Second, you've got to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. That means you've got to be committed. You've got to be all in. The totality of your being. He's not just the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, or the God of Jacob. He's not just the God of Moses. He's not even just the God of the Bible. He must be your God. He must be my God. And if we don't have a love for God that leads us to unquestioned obedience to him, don't be surprised when our children view God as just something else that's in their lives. Third, you gotta teach your family. And the best way is by example. Do they know that you have a real relationship with Christ? Do they see you praying and talking to God? Do they see you living out a real life of faith in obedience? Not pharisaical kind of religion where you got a list of rules that you follow but I'm talking about real faith where you and God are sharing life every one of us in this room desire to have that kind of impact be it our children our grandchildren our nieces our nephews any, anywhere where we have the opportunity to have influence into the next generation we want that kind of influence. And I can tell you when you realize that you've had it, when your daughter comes up on the platform and prays, when your son gives you a telephone call his senior year in college and says, Dad, I need some godly advice, you realize, you know what, I made a ton of mistakes as a dad, a ton of mistakes as a mom, a ton of mistakes as an aunt, a ton of mistakes as an uncle. I've, I've made a ton of mistakes, but I did something right. I, I pray that every one of us would have that sense. And, and let me just say, because I, I, watched, I watched my father go to his grave grieving over a child that even though mom and dad had poured into her life, was still in rebellion at the time my dad died. And so if you're in that space this morning, don't give up. Keep praying. It's about 25 years after my dad had passed away that I had the privilege of baptizing my older sister. Don't give up. Don't give up. Father, I pray this morning for our families. God, you were sending your children into a pagan culture and you wanted to make sure that there was a foundation that was there that would preserve them and protect them. And God, every day we send our children, our grandchildren, we send our nieces, our nephews, we send those people in our lives into a pagan culture. And so God, help us to understand the importance of giving them this foundational understanding that you are God that we love you which means we are obedient committed loyal and Father the relationship that we have with you is something we talk about and we live out in our lives. Father, would you bless our families this morning? In Jesus' name.